This may be the best advice you've ever had for whitetail hunting. And I guarantee you, regardless of your experience, you're going to learn something about finding bigger deer. That's because your experience can actually have a negative impact on your scouting. Some people come to learn that they never see big bucks in this area, so they think they're not there. Today's guest is here to tell you that not only may there be big bucks right under your nose, but much of what you've thought about the rut is just flat out wrong. Bill Thompson has hunted his entire life, and he's spent the last 20 years tracking down terrorists for the United States. Bill took what he learned about tracking and data science from the military, and he's applied it to more than 400 years of data science on whitetail deer. And he's here to show you just a little sample of what he's learned. Now, before we unveil on this, and I got to say, this is one of my favorite shows we've ever done on Gearbox Talk, so please stick around. But before we go on, I want to say subscribe to the channel if you're watching on YouTube. Hit subscribe, make sure you hit the bell icon so you don't miss any of our, our posts or our, our notifications or our other content. Gearbox Talk drops every Wednesday at 7.30. You do not want to miss it. And also one final message before we start. Just want to let you know that if you download the Go Wild app, you know, the, the company that brings you Gearbox Talk and this show every week, and if you download our platform and you join, I'm going to give you $10 for creating an account. That's 10 bucks you can put towards camo, optics, boots, whatever your little heart desires. And you can go on to earn future rewards too. Discounts, gift cards, free swag, free gear. I'll put the link in the show notes, but you can go to downloadgowild.com, download the app, create an account. Once you do that, you'll be a part of the best social media platform for hunters and anglers, period. And once you do that, you'll have a place to share that big buck you're going to get this year after listening to this episode of Gearbox Talk. This is Gearbox Talk with Bill Thompson. Get ready for showtime, for showtime. Thompson, you've got the most patriotic background I think I've had on the show in a while. I love the fact you got George Washington hanging out back there. How's it going, man? Good. How are you doing, buddy? Doing well, man. I am excited to get you on here to talk about a product that, I, I, let's just say it, nobody knows about it yet. I mean, we're going to talk about something that they, they're all passionate about and that it's whitetail scouting, but they have not seen what we're going to unveil today. And we're going to dive into this a little bit. Bill's going to show us some screenshots. This is going to be a little bit of an unusual gearbox talk. Normally, we don't have a, a presentation per se, but he's going to share a screen so that you all really get to see some of this imagery. I want to talk first, though, Bill, just a fun question for you right out of the gate. What is the most important factor for scouting whitetail? You know, we all hear about a combination of pinch points, bedding areas, food, pressure, et cetera. But in your opinion, like what's the number one thing to consider when you're looking for whitetail habitat? When I'm looking for whitetail habitat, I'm looking for transition and habitat. So in other words, where two types of habitat come together and then generally, not always, but generally it's an, in, an inaccessible area where the sunlight can hit the ground. Those are like the three first things that I'm looking for when I'm doing digital scouting. Not always. What's that? I said, that's awesome. It reminds me of my show with Parker. He talks like transitions, transitions, transitions was all he hit. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, if you're focusing on just the bedding, then, then I, then I, I tend to look for topography that has that where the sun is hitting the ground um, on public lands. If you're, especially if you're going after trophy deer, trophy animals, you're not going to find any of them where there's not plenty of ground cover. Um, and that, like, if you can walk easily through the area that you're looking at, then you're in the wrong area, mm -hmm. um, unless you're on, like, a deer preserve. But when you're actually looking for, like, those 150, 160 guys, I don't know if you can see, there's, like, a good 140 behind me here. You can't see him, but um, knows. he was killed in a swamp between two, like, where two ridges come together. Um, and, you know, it was very, very difficult to get to. So you're hunting those open areas that are, you know, where it, there's a tiny opening where that deer might come to on that transition, but it, it was hard to get to. It's kind of the, the condensed version of that. Yep, you got it. All right, we're going to see some images of what he's talking about in a second. But, you know, Bill, your background is in the military. You track terrorists uh, with, with data for, for two decades. And first, thank you for your service. Uh, but, but coming out of the military, you know, you've really built this product that I've gotten to see from kind of the tail end of pre-launch. Now I'm, I've got it on my phone and I love this thing. And, and this is not a paid ad, uh, but, but you've, you've built this product that uses the experience, the experience of your background to help people find whitetail. You know, you're using data in a very similar way to help people do in some ways, kind of what you've done for the last two decades uh, to do that though. You've looked at literally hundreds of years of deer data. 
And I'm, I'm just curious before we dive into talking more about Spartan Forge, did you find anything that was surprising amid the data? Like, did, was, were there anything you came out of it and were like, well, oh, didn't know that? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple of things in the deer data that I think is, uh, is, is super interesting. I, I guess like the more, the, the initial one would be deer bed a lot closer to areas where you wouldn't think they would be. Um, I'm always reminded of in, in Alabama. I've got a visitor in here, by the way. My daughter, who's supposed to be upstairs watching a show, just showed up. So <laughs> it's all right. Um, sorry about this. Your box talks family um, friendly. We're good. Yeah, s- single dad syndrome here. So uh, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm getting uh, Hillary. She'll leave me alone as soon as this comes off, though. I I, I would say uh, getting into what were we addressing? We were addressing uh, talking um, about your surprise. Like, are there surprise finds? Oh, surprises. Yeah. So I'm always reminded of Alabama data, and in this Alabama data. Um, that I have access to, there was a very good buck that was bedding in a drainage that was on a public road that hunters were driving over to get to the parking lot. And the buck was just bedding in these like tall cattails and like reeds and uh, like just a you know, small area. I, I don't think the area was any bigger than an acre. Um, and he was the only deer that was collared that would bed in there. Um, and it wasn't always the case, but I would say 40 or 50% of the time, if he exited bedding and saw, uh, you know, if they were, they had a register log, the, the university is running the study, had a log of people who could hunt the land. So if on the log, there were people parked in that parking lot, the buck would just go the other way. Never know. So I'm not there. saying he's seeing, I'm not saying he's seeing cars and going the other way. I'm just saying, I don't know if he's smelling human or exhaust or whatever. And that just signals danger and that animal's just going the other way. Um, that would be one. And then another one that I'm interested for that always interested me was um, there was some uh, 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 some Louisiana data that we had where there was a buck that was a much, very mature deer, but probably six years old. And long story short, he would just scent check all of the feeding stations and uh, and the hunting club that allowed the, the collared deer study on there thought he was a traveler buck. In other words, like a buck that just showed up every once in a while, but he was betting on the property. He was always in there. He just avoided all of the areas where there was any type of human scent, and he didn't congregate with other deer. He would just scent check them. In fact, the only times they would get pictures of him would be around the rut where he has smelled like a hot or an estrus doe, and then he would get caught on camera. But then he would go back and he would bet on this like inhospitable ridge where you couldn't get to. And um, I believe the deer ended up dying on that on that side of that hill where he would bed. And just no one hunted there. Right. Um, and they all had access and he was always on the property and it was he was always there. So some of these uh, wily animals can get pretty tough to, to target. I think you also told me um, about an example of, of like you guys have even seen the data where trail camera points one way and buck consistently will move away from that tree, right? Like you, you've kind of seen some of that behavior too. Is that right? Yeah. There, so I was part of, I had data from a scraping study where they had... Um, where they had uh, cameras over scrapes and these collared deer and there was a, a mature buck. And I think I know exactly what study you're talking about. Um, but essentially he was just scent checking these scrapes and he very rarely worked them. So people had like scrape cameras up and then you'd see does and other deer going through there. But this buck would always just, if it was a North wind, he'd just be heading South right below that camera. And all he was trying to figure out was if a hot doe had worked that scrape or not and he had no interest in working it himself that is not the rule by the way that is an exception but it is something that surprised me from the beginning that some of these animals can really beat you um my i guess my third and last experience to kind of cap this off is um bucks do do once or twice a year you'll see the gps data they'll do like what's called an excursion where they leave their home range their traditional home range and they will go somewhere else um and try to find a hot doe or, 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 you know, for whatever purpose they're leaving the area where they spend 99% of the year. Um, uh, but very rarely do I see traveler bucks. I see the term get used way more than it's actually a thing. Like guys will always say like, Oh, I caught a traveler buck on uh, my camera and I, I got to get in there and kill him." And it's like, I don't, like if I had to guess, I'd say 60 or 70% of the time that deer is probably in your area a lot more than, you know, and you just haven't caught them on camera. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, 
a lot of this goes back to the old adage of like, they don't get big by being stupid. And what you're seeing is a lot of these, that they're just super skeptical of any, any foreign scent. It sounds like, or, or it could be other activity. Like you said, it could be or even, they even don't like other deer. Mm -hmm. Like I've just seen bucks that just don't with the exception of a couple of weeks during when they're bachelored up. Um, as soon as the antlers peel, they don't, you don't find them around deer. Like the other thing that this data has taught me is I basically have like two modes of hunting. If I'm trying to put meat in the freezer, then I'll focus on like your traditional, you know, when people talk about topographic choke points and these types of things, especially on public land, those don't work as well um, for your trophy class animals, at least from what I've seen in the data and what I've seen pragmatically on the ground. So if I'm hunting like a 150, one, if I get like a 150 plus or 140 plus on public on camera, if I get into an area and I'm seeing doe or small bucks, I already know I'm not killing this deer today. Mm. Like the only, the only sit that makes sense to me to kill those deer is a sit where I'm not seeing anything until I see that buck. And so for me, that was, a, it's diff, it's a difficult grind because if you're hunting a mature trophy class animal on public line correctly, you're not seeing a lot of other deer. Right. And if you are, they're way off in the distance. So it's a little, it's like demoralizing, but that's what you should, that's because you want to see deer because you're out there to shoot a deer. Yeah. But so it's kind of yeah. almost. Now, I mean, if you're just out there to see deer and you're, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. But no, it's, I say, it's almost counterintuitive because you, you, if you're, especially if you're new to whitetail, like you would think like, oh, I'm in a good deer spot, right? <laughs> it's like all the deer come here to yeah. hang out like a nightclub, but it's not necessarily like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I always make the comparison, but you know, uh, you're not going to find, you know, how can I put this? I, I always use this analogy because it works and I'm sorry if it's getting overused here, but if you have like, you know, Rambo in the jungle and you drop a ton of cheeseburgers in the middle of the jungle, Rambo sees those and he runs the other direction, right? John Rambo is getting as far away from the cheeseburgers as he can. Whereas everybody else, right. Who hasn't, you know, been an ODA guy or an 18 guy and uh you know eat snakes for a living we'll see those cheeseburgers and figure out how they can get as close to them as possible and get as many as they can right away and then get out of there right right so it's the same thing with deer when you have like a bait station or you have a plot if these are pressured deer and a lot of deer are hanging out there um they're gonna stay away from the other deer yeah yeah that's what uh i, I was just talking to somebody that was asking me about like should i bait and my answer is like, well, baiting, all baiting does is to like teach you how to bait. It doesn't necessarily teach you where the deer are going to be. You know, I, I, I've had much more success setting up on areas with trail cameras where I think a deer would be moving through than trying to bring a deer to my stand with a camera, like a pile of corn. Um, I used to do that a lot, but it's just not, I don't think you're actually learning that much about animal behavior. I think other than they like corn, <laughs> it's like, okay. Yeah. I mean, but, but, like, there are most, situations. Yeah. But, it, but I'm sorry, go ahead. Of, no, it's all right. I mean, I, I killed a deer off corn in Texas and that's how they hunt to pull them out of the cacti. But the, um, you know, uh, the typically around here, like you're, you're, yeah. you're going to have up until, and then you got a lot of places you got to stop baiting right before season too. Yeah. So now there's, there's no food source there. They're not coming back to that spot anyways. You were kind of redirecting uh, to get them to a point that they're not normally coming to. The better method is what we've discussed, like setting up where they're more likely to be. Yeah, exactly. And, and there are there are locations where you can get away with baiting and you can be successful with trophy class animals. I'm not saying that's not the thing, right? But for the majority of the population that doesn't have access to those unpressured places um, and is focusing on public land, um, if you just want to kill deer, then you can kind of use that heuristic or that method that I described before, where you're just looking for those areas. But then if you're looking for caliber deer, high caliber deer, like you know, really trophy class deer. You have to go where a humans aren't willing to go or very rarely go um, or don't know to go, like I said, near a parking lot um, or B, um, you need to be willing to not see deer and maintain that kind of mental fortitude that comes with that because it, it's a grind. It becomes a grind like um, I've had this experience personally. And then what, what, what works for me really well is. I'm hunting bucks and then I'm not seeing anything for a while. I get demoralized and I, I'm going to go put some deer. I'm going to go put some meat in the freezer Then I'll hunt some does or smaller bucks or whatever. And just be like, all right, you still know what you're doing. Now get back after that buck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no, for sure. Um, hey man, we got about 15 minutes left here. I want to, I want to uh, go through your app. So go ahead and get your share screen up if you don't mind. 
And uh, while you're doing this, I want to frame up something. One thing that came up with my talk with Parker McDonald, which is a great show. We'll put a link to it in the show notes here. And people can find this to hear more about his scouting. And he's using the Spartan Forge app. Uh, I want to talk to you about foliage and some of the the information that people are going to be able to find accessible. So walk us just through some of the imagery differentiators for Spartan Forge and how you guys are using the information like what we're looking at here to help people identify uh, where where good spots to hunt would be around them. Yeah, so these are this is a couple of examples of imagery. So what, basically what we have is we have an application that has all of your traditional, you know, map and all that, that type of functionality that's coming out with the property lines and all of that stuff. Then we have the neural network and the deer prediction, and I can talk about that a little bit later. But then also we're integrating in a couple of months here with a satellite provider um, where we've done a deal where you can order this kind of custom imagery. Now, at first glance, this imagery doesn't look like it's all that great. This is like one meter um, resolution imagery. And, you know, when you're getting into, you know, what might get on Google, you're into the centimeters. But what's good about this imagery is there's a couple of things. A is you can designate either pull it from a historical imagery, and it's very cheap when you do it that way, or you can task a satellite to go out and get the imagery for you. And, and you, so you can dictate the when and the where of that. And the imagery is taken in a sun synchronous fashion where you're getting the satellite right over top of the imagery. And there's a couple of things you get from this is it becomes very easy. Can you see my mouse here? Yeah. It becomes very easy to see transition and where there's, you know, um, coniferous versus deciduous trees that are holding their foliage throughout the year. And then you can see these transitions, but then also you can see a lot of different types of, um, I'll go to a different image here. You can see a lot of different types of like um, transition, but also paths that are used for logging or whatever, access, whatever, that you can't see when there's even the smallest bit of angle of arrival on the satellite or on the airplane when it's taking the imagery. But because this is right over top, you're going to be able to see logging trails and you're going to be able to dictate the time of the year. And so like in the south, that's a very small window. So you can go back and pull imagery from like two months of the year. Or if there's been recent logging, you can pull imagery after the logging and you can display that on your map and interact with it. And then you'll have the high resolution mapping that we offer. But then you'll also have this, which, you know, if I had to choose between the two, I'm honestly taking this because I can just understand a lot more about the land and I can understand where those transitions are and, and, and the differences. And then I can also get, you can also order, and part of it is this NDVI data, which essentially just allows you to see where there's vegetation growing. It, it, the, the, dark is, the dark green is trees and the light green is either ground or water. And so you can really start to see these areas that are you know, kind of out in the middle of nowhere where the sunlight's able to hit the ground and you have like a, a cut or whatever after one or two years where you, where those are, that's where the deer are going to be feeding. So again, even though this doesn't look like it's super helpful, it's going to allow you to see things like water sources that are kind of in the middle of nowhere, um, transition lines and areas where the sun is hitting the ground. But then also if you want to launch this over a field, it'll give you the health index of the field. So we're going to be doing crop layers and stuff like that, like everyone else is doing. But then what farmers use that, and DVI data for is assessing the crop health. And then you can actually see in the field where health, healthier plants are growing and where less healthy plants are growing and you know start to pull apart why. Why is that important to the hunter? Well, um, if you've got really good growth on the western part of the field, it becomes obvious in this data. And then you can make a guess about where the bucks might be hanging out or the does at night as they're coming into these fields because they like to be in the luscious part of the field. So there's a lot of things here. There's a lot of stuff, but essentially people will be able to order this imagery custom and have it displayed on their map. And uh, it's going to be super helpful for people, especially like logging roads or if you're hunting big timber, uh, logging roads are key. And what this imagery does is it makes logging roads very obvious. Um, once again, because you're right over top of it, you can see all of this stuff where as you wouldn't Talk be able to see. Talk through the logging roads, Bill. Bill, give people an idea of what you mean by logging roads are key. Okay, so when you're hunting like in a big woods setting, uh, there'll be you'll have timber that's approved for harvest. Somebody's going in there for firewood or whatever, or building wood, whatever they're going in there for. They'll get approved by a national forest to go in and clear a part of the bush of the trees in order to log. And then they, what they have to do is they usually these timber companies or these individuals will have to either find access on an existing logging road or they'll have to have one built. And essentially, it's just they follow the contour lines or the elevation 
of the area. It gets you to wherever the harvest happens. And then what you'll have is over years and years, these logging roads, like I said, they want to take advantage of previously um, uh, logged roads. So they'll build off of each other and they create these kinds of like um, spider webs yeah. of traffic. And when you're hunting like, you know, 30,000 acres in Northern Pennsylvania, and you can get really way back somewhere where these logging roads come together, it, it, it provides two things. It provides travel routes, but then it also um, provides undergrowth or understory that the deer feed on. And then on, if you see where a bunch of these logging roads come together, generally there'll be scraping activity where they come together. Generally they'll be feeding. And then it's also um, good for access for hunters. So knowing that information, and you really can't get that from most imagery data that's out there, even the high, very high resolution stuff, because if you're at any kind of an angle, it obstructs your view of the path. But when you're right over top, you can see all of it. So it's very uh, beneficial to your kind of like white tail fanatics. Yeah. And, and like Parker was saying, you know, his Onyx app where he hunts, it's all foliage. And with you guys, he's been able to find areas that you can see the kind of imagery we're seeing here. Uh, we should call out that you're still, you know, you guys are brand new. You're still in beta, uh, which for anybody that doesn't understand all, what that term means, it means that you guys are still getting the product out there and still testing a little bit of it. But um, and and I've looked at my area uh, and and where I hunt public land in eastern Kentucky, it's all very much uh, like what you've shown here, less foliage. Some of my closer areas are still foliage, but you guys are updating that. So I just want to call that out for anybody that tries it. Uh, can you explain kind of the timeline real quickly here of of like what to expect over the next few months from you guys? Yeah, so in the next couple of months, you'll be able to on-demand imagery order this stuff. So those areas that you talked about where we still have foliage imagery, you know, for between six or 10 bucks, you can go and grab your own imagery like this, like we're talking about right now, and display that on your map. And then probably either towards the end of the season, like December or January, um, but for sure by next season, we'll be ingesting a ton of leaf off imagery like we have right now. Um, that we're just finishing the contracts on essentially and users will be able to have you know access to you know uh, best case scenario six years of historical data all high res in one area worst case scenario maybe one or two years of high res leaf off imagery um, and we're, the coverage is something like 88 percent of the u.s or 90 percent of the u.s so um that that's a very large muscle movement to get mm -hmm. all of that put into place, but uh, it is something that we're doing for next for certainly for next year, um, but probably testing this year. Okay, uh, Bill, I brought you off the screen share here. I want to talk a little bit about really quickly. Um, you guys have a really robust forecast screen here, and I don't know if you mind me uh, just kind of showing like how much is here. Talk through this and how to use this with your all's platform, because a lot of the AI that you've built in, you know, obviously people, if you pull up your property, you're not going to have the collar deer data uh, on your property, like showing where the bucks are moving on your spot. How do they use this though, to take those insights that you guys have pulled and hunt better? Yeah. So there's, there's a few ways to do that. Um, on that forecast screen, there's a historical tab. The historical tab is probably what I use the most whenever I'm doing my cyber scouting. Um, any place that you place that marker on the ground, though there's a little crosshair right in the middle of the screen, and then you flip over to that forecast and then subsequent historical screen, it'll show you all of the, the weather, um, uh, the historical weather in that area, and you can define it for two weeks, for a month, three months, or all time, which we have, I think, seven years of data, and it's about to turn into 30 years of data, where you can look at the historical winds by month, month by month. And due to, you know, a lot of atmospheric conditions, you generally have the same winds year by year in the same place as we, you know, revolve around the sun. And uh, so, you know, if you're going to go be doing a, say you're cyber scouting a hunt in Missouri, you can go to the area, the national forest or private land, whatever you're looking at, place the crosshairs there, flip over to the forecast. You can look at what, you know, you'll, you'll get on the Intel tab, you'll get all of the, you know, buck to doe ratios, number of deer that are in the woods, number of hunters, success by, pl by platform. But then when you click on that historical wind, you can see on a polar plot or what people call a wind rose, uh, essentially what's the, what, what does the wind tend to be and what has it been in the past? And then once you understand that, and basically the polar plot, it's just the easy way to understand it is wherever the largest spike is from a cardinal direction perspective, that's what the wind tendency is in that area. Um, so if you were to pull it up for your area right now, it'd probably be majority south. Yep. And then that'll slowly shift to west as we get closer yeah, to southwest. the winter. Southwest on the plot I'm looking at right now. Yep, exactly. And then, and like I said, that's just, that's, that is pretty consistent year by year. Um, 
And then what you can do with your cyber scouting is say, okay, in this area, now I'm going to use the topography layer and I'm going to go scout for leeward ridges um, and look and use, you know, this high resolution um, uh, sun synchronous imagery to now look for like logging trails in those leeward sections. And now you're kind of narrowing down how much boot leather you need to burn when you get on the ground and you're doing that all in one app. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, uh, that Intel tab as well provides you with like, um uh, your largest tracks of public land but it also we did a ton of research on where uh the largest bucks have been taken on public land and notable parts of public land and so when we drop that in there it's basically um this is either the place where the largest deer historically come out of or where you've had the most pope and young entries um with a bow or boone and crockett um in the last few years so we call those out as well so really what we're trying to do is every hunter has a targeting cycle just like in the military, we're trying to isolate all of the variables in that targeting cycle and then present it all in one all-encompassing app. So soup to nuts, like beginning to end, you can understand everything you need to understand about the deer woods um, to inform your scouting before you hit the ground. This app does not replace scouting. Um, you still need to get out there and burn boot leather. Like we have a wear feature that we're going to be doing towards the end of the year as well that will essentially point out places on a map uh, where you could look for deer activity. Um, and it uses some of those uh, mechanisms that we just talked about to do those calculations, but by no means replaces scouting. You still have to burn yeah. boot leather. It's just our hope you're burning less and you're being with your family more <laughs> and still being successful. Well, and two, if you're, if you're new to hunting, this is a great resource. I mean, you guys have got, you know, what they're eating in here and, and what to like look for, for cover, um, things to things that denote good, your areas too because a lot of this stuff yeah, like, exactly I mean, if you're looking at, if you've never done this look at a map and then you show up sometimes it still feels very different than looking at it overhead and you know you get there and if you're on a huge track of public land um you know things might not look as good as parker's talked about that a ton you show up at places you've spent hours scouting and sometimes it's different than what you thought right the, the, as you said you can't replace boots on the ground but this app will help you learn um not only you know the the contour lines and some of the wind stuff but there there's other just straight up you know learning how to hunt whitetail better um this also man i feel like down the road, you guys are going to get a lot of bird hunters in, interested with this over the historical winds. Because if you're scouting public and trying to figure out where to set, you know, that's a really important part uh, for any waterfowl, um, you know, yeah. depending on when, how, which direction they're going to come in from. I, I love what you guys are doing, man. Uh, we got a couple minutes here. Give people the the where to find you guys and kind of, uh, you know, how to get involved with Spartan Forge. So um, our website is www.spartanforge.ai. Um, you can find on there are links to our Instagram and our Facebook. Um, in about a day or two, we'll be dropping. So on probably the sixth or the seventh, we'll be announcing our veterans hunt that's taking place in P Pennsylvania, where people can do participate. Just got to sign up for our newsletter and uh, take us on social media, and you'll sign up for a raffle. Uh, we got great sponsorships: uh, Black Rifle Coffee, um, First Light, uh, Tethered Tree Saddles. All of those guys are donating product. Um, Spy Point cameras. All of them are do donating product people will be able to win um they'll be paired up with a pro staffer and then we're going to hunt over veterans day weekend and write a check to the boot campaign for all the money that we raised surrounding the event so um the, the, that's kind of what's happening right now and uh um you know we've got some great pro staff whether it's the seek one guys andy may uh, bo martonic um uh johnny uh stewart uh greg litzinger garrett prawl i mean half of our pro staff have already put, put a big deer on the ground this year um, and all of them are using the application and, um, it really drives, it informs a lot of decision-making. So we're pretty excited to do all of this. Yep. I was just on a podcast with Bo the other day and, uh, he, he spoke highly of you guys too. All right. This was awesome, Bill. Thanks for coming on the show. Uh, I, if you haven't go ahead and subscribe to the go wild channel, uh, make sure you, we'll put links to everything that Bill mentioned in there. Uh, Bill, you guys got to go Wild account now too, right, man? Yep, right. sure do. Got to get that in that Facebook Instagram lineup because we didn't go down yesterday. I don't know if you saw the data outage, but go wild <laughs> up while Facebook and Instagram were down. So uh, follow them on Go Wild. Uh, you also see them popping up. We are again. This show was not sponsored, but uh, Bill Bill kind of came to Go Wild to help spread the word a little bit too. So you might see some content from Spartan Forge in the Go Wild platform. We're gonna put um, a link to again the the app itself in the show notes, and uh, you, you know again subscribe so you can come back every week and see content from smart people like bill all right bill thanks for doing it man thanks for having me on yes sir